Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Vice Chair Richard Clarida. Uh, prior to joining the Board of Governors, Vice Chair Clarida had a distingu distinguished career as an academic, as a policymaker, and in the private sector. His experience spans 30 years with the Department of Economics at Columbia University and a variety of high-level policy positions. You know, Rich and I actually have a number of things in common. We were both, as was David, assistant secretaries at the Treasury Department at different times under different Treasury secretaries. Uh, Rich and I both went to the University of Illinois in Urbana, and we both overlapped together at PIMCO. Other than those, are, that's what we have in common. You're going to see there's a lot of things that are different between the two of us. Um, but Rich is a great colleague to have, and we're thrilled to have him at the Board of Governors. He also served on the Council of Economic Advisors under President Reagan. Uh, today's conference, just to put it in context, is one event in a year-long series that Rich is overseeing on behalf of the Federal Reserve System. So what's going on? Uh, we are taking a step back and assessing how we approach monetary policy. It's not about current economic conditions. It's about do we have the right way of thinking about monetary policy? Are we, do we have the right goals and are we approaching it the right way? I'll let Rich talk about it more, but we're really thrilled that Rich is here and Rich has agreed to take questions from all of us. The only request that I have of you is let's, you know, we have Rich Clare to hear. Everyone may ask him, when are we going to cut rates or when are we going to raise rates? Let's try to focus the questions on the topic at hand and the discussion that we've been having today and his comments today. If you could do that, I would very much appreciate it. So with that, please join me in welcoming Rich Clare. Neil, thank you for that, for that kind introduction. I should also uh, mention that Mary Daly, I believe, spent some time at the University of Illinois. So the fighting Illini are, are in force in the Federal Reserve System. I am generally really pleased and, and, and really honored to attend this Fed Listens event on the distributional consequences of the business cycle and monetary policy. The Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is really a natural and ideal venue for discussing this topic in the context of the broad review of our monetary policy framework that we are undertaking uh, this year. And to get off the script a little bit, and I'm really grateful uh, to Neil for, for getting this event scheduled early on in the year to really lead by example about what an event like this uh, can, can be. So thank you so much, Neil and, and team. Let's talk a little bit about the review. In our review, we are examining the policy strategies, the tools, and the communication practices that the FOMC uses to pursue the Fed's dual mandate goals of maximum employment and price stability. I will speak this evening about the motivation for and the scope of our review. We are bringing open minds to it and are seeking perspectives from a broad range of interested individuals and groups. And as the panel of researchers we heard from this afternoon and community leaders we will hear from tomorrow. To us it simply seems just like good institutional practice to engage broadly with the public in this review as part of a comprehensive approach to enhance transparency and accountability. Now let's remember the Federal Reserve has been charged by the Congress with a dual mandate to achieve maximum employment and price stability. And this review will take that mandate as given. Moreover, the review will take as given that a 2% rate of inflation in the PCE price, it, price index is the operational goal most consistent with our price stability mandate. While we believe that our existing framework for conducting monetary policy has served the public well, the purpose of this review is to evaluate and assess ways in which our existing framework might be improved so that we can best achieve our dual mandate objectives on a sustained basis. That said, based upon the experience of other central banks that have undertaken similar reviews, our review is more likely to produce an evolution, not a revolution in the way that we conduct monetary policy. With the U.S. economy operating at or close to our maximum employment and price stability goals, now is an especially opportune time to conduct this review. The unemployment rate is at a 50-year low, and inflation is running close to our 2% objective. We want to ensure that we are well positioned to continue to meet our statutory goals in coming years. In addition, the Federal Reserve used new policy tools 
and enhanced its communications practices in response to the global financial crisis, and the review will evaluate these changes. Furthermore, the U.S. and foreign economies have evolved significantly since the experience that informed much of the pre-crisis approach. Perhaps most significantly, neutral interest rates appear to have fallen in the U.S. and abroad. Moreover, this global decline in what we call our star is widely expected to persist for years. The decline in neutral policy rates likely reflects several factors, including aging populations, changes in risk-taking behavior, and a slowdown in productivity growth. These factors' contributions are highly uncertain, but irrespective of their precise role, the policy implications of a decline in neutral interest rates are important. All else equal, a fall in neutral rates increases the likelihood that a central bank's policy rate will reach its effective lower bound um, in a future downturn. That development, in turn, could make it more difficult during downturns for monetary policy to support household spending, investment, employment, and keep inflation from falling too low. Another key development in recent decades is that inflation appears less responsive to resource slack. That is, the short-run Phillips curve that we heard about today appears to have flattened, implying a change in the dynamic relationship between inflation and employment. A flatter Phillips curve is, in a sense, a proverbial double-edged sword. It permits the Federal Reserve to support employment more aggressively during downturns because the sustained inflation breakout is less likely when a Phillips curve is flatter. However, a flatter Phillips curve also increases the cost, in terms of economic output, of reversing an unwelcome increase in longer-run inflation expectations. Thus, a flatter Phillips curve makes it all the more important that longer-run inflation expectations remain anchored at levels consistent with our 2% inflation objective. Finally, and I think appropriate for this conference, the strengthening of the labor market in recent years has highlighted the challenges of assessing the proximity of labor market to full employment lag of the Fed's dual mandate. The unemployment rate, which stood at 3.8% in March, has been interpreted by many observers as suggesting that the labor market is currently operating beyond full employment. However, the level, of the level of the unemployment rate that is consistent with full employment is not something that we directly observe. We have to infer it and estimate it from data. The range of plausible estimates likely extends at least as low as the current level of the unemployment rate. For example, in the February Blue Chip Economic Outlook Survey, the average estimate of the natural rate of unemployment for the bottom 10 respondents was at 3.9% as compared with 4.7% for the highest 10 respondents. And these are, of course, all economic experts. So there's a range of views on, on our star, on U star as well. The decline in the unemployment rate in recent years has been accompanied by an increase in labor force participation with especially pronounced gains for individuals in their prime working years. These increases in participation have provided employers with a significant source of additional labor input and may be one factor restraining inflationary pressures. But as with the unemployment rate, whether participation will continue to increase in a tight labor market remains uncertain. The strong job gains in recent years have also delivered benefits to groups that have historically been disadvantaged in the labor market. For example, African Americans and Hispanics have experienced persistently higher unemployment rates than whites for many decades. However, those unemployment rate gaps have narrowed as the labor market has strengthened, and there is some indication of an extra benefit to these groups as the unemployment rate moves into very low territory. Likewise, although unemployment rates for less educated workers are higher persistently than they are for more educated workers, such gaps as well appear to narrow as the labor market strengthens. And wage increases in the past couple of years have been strongest for less educated workers and for those at the lower end of the wage distribution. Let's talk now about the scope of the review. Our existing monetary policy strategy is laid out in the committee's statement on longer-run goals and monetary policy strategy. This was first adopted in 2012, and the statement has been reaffirmed at the start of each subsequent year, including earlier this year with the unanimous support of all 17 committee participants. 
The statement indicates that the committee seeks to mitigate deviations of inflation from 2% and deviations of employment from its assessment of its maximum level. In doing so, the committee recognizes that these assessments of maximum employment are necessarily uncertain and subject to revision. According to the Federal Reserve Act, the employment objective is on equal footing with the inflation objective. Now, as a practical matter, our current strategy shares many elements with a policy framework that's sometimes called flexible inflation targeting in the academic literature. However, the Fed's mandate is much more explicit about the role of employment than those of most other central banks. And our statement reflects this by stating that when the two sides of the mandate are in conflict, neither one takes precedent over the other. We believe that this transparency about the balanced approach that the committee takes has served us well over the past decade, in particular when high unemployment called for extraordinary policies that entailed, at the time, some perceived risk of inflation. The review of our outlook and framework will be wide-ranging and we will not prejudge where it will take us, but events of the past decade highlight three broad questions that we'll try to answer. The first question is, can the Federal Reserve best meet its objectives with its existing monetary policy strategy? Or should it consider strategies that aim to reverse past misses of the inflation objective? Under our current approach, as well as that of many other central banks around the world, persistent shortfalls of inflation that many advanced economies have experienced over the past decade are treated as bygones. This means that policy today is not adjusted to offset past inflation shortfalls with future overshoots of inflation. And to be clear, nor would persistent overshoots of inflation trigger policies that aim to undershoot the inflation target. Central banks are generally believed to have effective tools for preventing persistent inflation overshoots, but the effective lower bound on interest rates make persistent undershoots more likely. Persistent inflation shortfalls carry the risk that longer-term inflation expectations become poorly anchored or become anchored below the stated inflation goal. In part because of that concern, some economists have advocated so-called make-up strategies under which policymakers seek to undo in part or in whole past inflation deviations from target. Such strategies include targeting average inflation over a multi-year period and versions of what's called price level targeting, in which policymakers seek to stabilize the price level around a constant growth path. These strategies have been suggested and could be implement, implemented either permanently or as a temporary response to extraordinary circumstances. For example, the central bank could commit at the time when the policy rate reaches the effective lower bound to maintain the policy rate at this level until inflation over the period has on average run at its target rate. Other makeup strategies seek to reverse shortfalls in policy accommodation at the lower bound by keeping the policy rate lower for longer than would otherwise be the case. In many models that incorporate the lower bound, these makeup strategies lead to better average performance on both legs of the dual mandate and thereby provide no conflict between the dual mandate goals. However, the benefits of makeup strategies rest heavily on households and firms believing in advance that the makeup will, in fact, be delivered when the time comes. For example, that a persistent inflation shortfall will be met by future inflation above 2% for some time. Now, as is well known from the research literature, makeup strategies in general are not time consistent because when the time comes to push inflation above 2%, Conditions at that time will not warrant doing so. Because of this so-called time inconsistency argument, which, by the way, was developed here in Minnesota by Prescott and Kidland uh, decades ago, the public would have to see a makeup strategy as a credible commit commitment for it to be successful. The important real-world consideration that I've just mentioned is often overlooked in academic literature in which central bank commitment devices are simply assumed to exist and to be instantly credible upon decree. Thus, one of the challenging questions that we'll face is whether central banks could in practice attain the benefits of makeup strategies that are possible in the theoretical models. 
The next question the review will consider is, are existing monetary po policy tools adequate to achieve and maintain maximum employment and price stability, or should the toolkit be expanded? And if so, how? The committee's primary means of changing the stance of monetary policy is adjusting the target rate range for the federal funds rate. In the fall of 2008, the committee cut that rate to just above zero in response to the financial crisis. Because the U.S. economy required additional policy accommodation after the lower bound was reached, the committee deployed two additional tools in the year following the crisis, balance sheet policies and forward guidance about the likely path of the funds rate. The committee altered the size and composition of the balance sheet through a sequence of large-scale security programs via a maturity extension program and by adjusting the reinvestment of principal payments of maturing securities. With regards to forward guidance, the committee initially made so-called calendar-based statements and later on it issued outcome-based guidance. Overall, the empirical evidence suggests that these added tools help stem the crisis and support economic recovery by strengthening the labor market and lifting inflation back towards 2%. That said, estimates of the effect of these policies range widely. In addition to assessing the efficacy of these tools, we will examine additional tools to ease policy uh, when and if the ELB is binding in the future. During the crisis and its aftermath, the Fed considered but ultimately found some of the tools deployed by other central banks around the world wanting relative to the alternatives that it did pursue. But our review will reassess our earlier findings in light of the more recent experience in other countries. The third question the review will consider is how can the committee's communication of its policy framework and implementation be improved? Our communication practices have evolved considerably since 1994 when the Fed released the first statement after an FOMC meeting. Over the past decade or so, the committee has enhanced its communication practices to promote public standing of it, understanding of its policy goals, its strategy, and actions, as well as to foster democratic accountability. These enhancements include the statement on longer-run goals and policy strategy, post-meeting press conferences, various statements about principles and strategy guiding the committee's normalization of policy, and quarterly summaries of individual participants' economic projections, assessments about the appropriate path of the policy rate, and judgments of uncertainty and the balance of risk around their projections. As part of the review, we will assess the committee's current and past communication and additional forms of communication that could be helpful. For example, there might be ways to improve communication about the coordination of the Fed's policy tools or the interplay between monetary policy and financial stability. Let me now conclude by talking about some activities and the timeline for the review. The review has several components. The board and the reserve banks are currently conducting uh, Fed listens events, and of course this is a very prominent and early example of that, in which we will be hearing from a broad range of interested individuals and groups, including business and labor leaders, academics, and community development advocates. The conference here at the Minneapolis Fed is one of these events, as was the community listening session that was hosted by the Dallas Federal Reserve in February. Several more Fed listens events will follow in May and, and more later in the year. In addition, we will be holding a system research conference on June 4th and 5th at the Federal Reserve Bank, Bank of Chicago with speakers and panelists from outside the Fed. The program includes overviews by academic experts on themes that are central to our review. The Committee's Monetary Policy Since the Financial Crisis, Assessments of Maximum Sustainable Employment, Alternative Policy Frameworks and Strategies, our policy tools, global considerations, and financial stability, as well as central bank communication. Two sessions will feature panels of community leaders who will share their perspectives on the labor market and the effect of monetary policy on their constituencies. Now, we expect to release summaries of these Fed Listens events and to live stream the Chicago conference. Building on the perspectives that we hear and on staff analysis, the committee will conduct its own assessment of its policy framework beginning around the middle of the year, and we plan to share our conclusions with the public in 2020. The economy is constantly evolving, bringing with it new policy challenges. 
And so it makes sense for us to remain open-minded as we assess current practice and assess ideas that could potentially enhance our ability to deliver on the goals that the Congress has assigned to us. For this reason, my colleagues and I do not want to preempt or to predict our ultimate finding. What I can say is that any refinements or more material changes to our framework that we might make will be aimed solely at enhancing our ability to achieve and sustain our dual mandate objectives in the world in which we live in today. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming here and this presentation. I'm a recovering economist, and uh, I appreciate uh, the leadership of President Kashkari here on bringing uh, employment to the Fed's attention always in terms of these discussions on monetary policy. And when I was in grad school 30 years ago, uh, the theory, there was an intriguing theory that the Fed does not control the economy or through monetary policy, but reacts to the economy. And that established, uh, say, big players like multinational corporations, uh, big businesses, they don't have a problem of finding capital. They can get it whatever the interest rate is. Yep. And so the problem is the, the policy interest rates are set on the assumption that everybody's is behaving like, like these big players who are outside the system. I just got a call from, while I'm sitting here, uh, from someone, and this is her story. Uh, she is a small entrepreneur, uh, is taking a loan from a loan shark. So a $75,000 loan to fix a business is now 135000 So. To be, to, I mean, my point that I'm trying to make is in this explanation, I mean, this uh, uh, research and, and exploration about monetary policy and, and distribution, you might have to take a different tack. And that is exploring uh, the voice of people on the street, how these channels of monetary policy impacts them and, and how they react to. And it probably would take a multidisciplinary perspective you probably need the sociologists and the anthropologists and the political scientists to get a handle on that, to get a meaningful solution, because currently this country is hurting because the benefits of the economy are not trickling down. And, and you are, and, and leaders are playing a very important role in changing that. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. I would just say that I think you have identified something that is a real priority of ours as well, is that in this framework review, we do want to listen to a broad range of, of, of individuals and, 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 and institutions to get a perspective, uh, you know, a more granular perspective of how our policy impacts the overall economy um, and, 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 and to gauge that. It's a, it's a high priority in the system, uh, but this year in particular is about focusing on, on listening, and I appreciate your, your comments. Thank you. Next question, comment. Don't be shy. Back there. Hi, I'm Josh Bivens from EPI. Hi, Josh. Uh, thank you for your speech. It was great. I, I had a question. So you mentioned before um, Congress gives the Fed its mandate. Since about, for a big part of the recovery, I would argue Congress was also keeping the Fed from being able to hit its dual mandate. Basically, the very severe fiscal contraction we had after about 2012 was the primary thing, holding back recovery, keeping both unemployment too high and inflation too low. What are the possibilities of part of the Fed's rethink is, you know, to be really blunt, just, just being more blunt with Congress and telling them the Fed will not hit its dual mandate because of the actions of Congress and the president in the fiscal stance. I feel like the Fed has tremendous credibility on Capitol Hill in terms of its assessment of what the macro economy needs. And I feel like sometimes over this past recovery, the Fed thought it was being kind of loud about what the fiscal stance was doing to recovery, but I don't know 
you know, being loud by the standards of normal human c- communication are different from what the Fed often thinks is being loud. And so I think more blunt communication to what the congressional fiscal stance is doing to recovery should be part of the mix as well. Well, I think that at the, at, at the Fed, we, we, we take fiscal policy as a given. That's the purview of the Congress and, and the White House, and it's, and it, and it's not in, in, in our uh, a mandate to, 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 um, to, to, uh, to conduct fiscal policy. What we do at the Fed is we take fiscal policy and fiscal projections as an input to the policy that we need to, to run. I wasn't at the Fed back in the period that, that you mentioned, but I do note that during that period, uh, you know, rates were at zero and we had various quantitative easing programs in, in play. Um, and I guess when the transcripts come out, we can learn about the factor that that played. But broadly speaking, fiscal policy is an input to what we, we do, and we take it into account in that way. But thank you, Josh. As an, as an, econ- as an academic, we just enough for econ- economics to be dangerous, mm-hmm. but not enough to understand it. And one of the things I've found about... Uh, how the Fed influences the, you know, the du- achievement of the dual mandate, is that the interest rate uh, adjustments feed, seem to feed into inflation much more readily. You know, it sort of has a very direct Im- impact on that aspect of the mandate versus the unemployment piece. I was just wondering, is, is, is part of your review also looking at tools that might you know, uh, sort of more directly influence the employment side of the equation? That's a good point, and I think at the broad, the broad uh, way I think about that is, is, is the, tran- the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. It's, a, it's an area in which the board has considerable expertise, you know, in large part to Dave's leadership for, for 30 years. And I think one of the great things that I've learned in my six months at the board um, is, is the staff and the governors are very attuned to the need to be flexible and attentive to evolutions and changes um, um, in the economy, you know, that said, you know, we have a pretty limited set of tools. They're really aggregate tools that impact averages in the overall economy. And we do need to, to, remember, to remember that. But I think your general observation, uh, you know, there are big changes in, in labor markets, you know, when, compared to when Neil and I were at the U of I decades ago. And we have to factor those into um, um, account, demographic changes and others. So I, I take, your, take your point. I can tell you it is a priority of the research that the, that the that the reserve banks uh, do as well as at the board. Rich, you mentioned that in the review, we're taking it as a given that 2% is the appropriate inflation target. When I travel around, sometimes people say to me, why is it 2%? Why isn't it lower? That's a common question. And there are other folks on the other side who say we should raise it because that'll be better for labor market outcomes. I'm just curious if you could talk about you know, why 2% and why have we just said, let's just leave that alone? It's a great point. I think in some ways uh, you, you provided part of the answer. There's a, you know, there, there's a range of you, and as, as a central bank, we have to take a view as a committee. And as you know, Neil, you've been involved in this uh, every January. We, we, discuss, we discuss that. Um, I think that, um, you know, 2%, two percent go all the way back to when Alan Greenspan was chair, and although he never defined 2%, he talked about a low ra- positive but low rate of inflation that didn't influence economic decisions. So I think the committee continues to believe that 2% satisfies that, uh, satisfies that definition. Um, again, you know, for those of us who experienced the 1970s and 80s uh, up close, uh, there's, there's a value to having credibility of that 2% target. So, as I said, you know, this is something that we've discussed among ourselves, and we've agreed that, uh, that, it, that it makes sense in this review to maintain that view of price stability as being 2% PCE inflation. But then the real question is how we measure that and over what time frame and with what set of, with what set of tools. So you, you did a great job of summarizing the goal of the listening series, and I'm just wondering if you're willing to give any early reflections on what you heard in Dallas or what you heard this morning that seems to stand out with particular bearing um, to the goals of the listening series, or, or if not, if that's for 2020, um, then, then what kinds of things are you most hoping to learn from this and from other events like this? Right. Well, I mean, I think, you know, again, uh, in today's sessions, I think in, in both, you know, 
I heard things that were, were helpful in putting in context, uh, you know, what, is, what does a full employment mandate mean? The statute uses the words maximum employment. It doesn't define that. And I think, you know, for the economist in the room, sometimes these, these conversations about the mandate can get very Nairu-centric. Are you a 4.1 or a 4.6? And I think what today reminded all, all of us, and I don't think I need a reminding, but it's useful to know that the labor market is a very complex organism, and it's useful to you know, keep your eye on multiple indicators of the health of the, of the labor market. So that's, that's certainly, uh, I think that's certainly relevant, uh, that's certainly relevant uh, here. Uh, and then you know, more broadly, the, you know, ultimately central banking is, it sometimes comes down to trade-offs, and so it's understanding. We talk about Phillips curve slopes and, and full employment. And again, both in this event and in the event that I did in, in Dallas, I found it individually, I found it useful to be getting insights not just about sort of the macro piece of what we do, but how what we do impacts individual, community, you know, individual communities and individual um, uh, uh, groups. And so I think, I think the process is off to a good start, thanks to you all in Dallas, and I'm sure more good events to, to come. So this is kind of piggybacking on uh, Mr. Kashkari's comment, but uh, is the uh, Fed maybe too concerned with inflation, not enough with unemployment? Why not push for 3% in general? There's a lot of, there's a lot of people that are convinced the, the, you know, the, yeah. we're more concerned about inflation than we are unemployment. Is there a reason we could get maybe more towards push, unemployment? Push for 3%. On the uh, for inflation. Oh, for inflation. Yeah. Well, as I said, you know, we we the, one of the big decisions the committee makes every d January is is how we define price stability, and I just went through the the different uh, aspects of that um, of that decision. Uh, but um, you know, that that's something that we're taking as given for this uh, review with unanimous support. So. Um, back to uh, the, the first question the gentleman asked, yeah. although the community development financial institutions are really more treasury programs than Federal Reserve ones, there are a series of, I mean, that's one of the transmission mechanisms yes. by which interest rates, because I, I know this particular Fed has done a lot of work on CDFIs. Are those kind of mechanisms also in your review, or is it really just on the primary mandate? Issues that Congress well, has given. Well, certainly, what you. I what I can say that is just in my my six months as a governor, uh, I've already we I've already met and we have met as as a board with the CDFI uh, representatives, and so you know I've become more aware of that of that piece of the economy than I was as a as a as a professor. So yes, that's and apart from the review, that I think that's something that the re, that the Reserve Banks and the board is 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 engaged with on an ongoing basis. Uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Given the discussion of diversity in labor markets, I'm wondering if you discuss some of the challenges in bringing those more granular issues into the committee and into a framework. Could you imagine, for example, ever having a, a, a debate turn around, well, unemployment's slow, but it's not very good for blacks, therefore we got to keep going? Well, I, I, think, I think at this stage we, we have our, our full employment mandate and our price stability mandate, and I think the reason that we have, that, we, that we're having the events and structuring this way is so we can hear from different groups and different individuals with a different perspective on what full employment uh, means, and I just leave it, at, uh, leave it at that. It's certainly more than just a number, and there are a range of things that, uh, uh, to, uh, to look at. Maybe time for one or two more, I think. Yeah. So as part of this discussion of how the distributional effects of monetary policy, um, I guess the counterpart to that is movements in the Fed funds rate are arguably a, a one tool and potentially a blunt tool f to affect an entire distribution. So is there a possibility of the discussion of alternative policy tools beyond just movements in the Fed funds rate and achieving maybe these broader objectives? Well, what I, can, what I would say on that is, is um, uh, the, 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 the committee um, has, uh, in the last year, looked at our existing, uh, existing toolkit. Again, for, for the, the dual mandate objectives, I said a maximum employment and price stability um, and, and we feel good about the toolkit that we have in a, in a prospering economy away from the effect of lower bound. The framework review will think about ways we might augment the toolkit 
in the event that it's some, in, in some future period that we might be close to or be hitting the effect of lower bound again, are there additional tools uh, there? But to, to, you know, I think we are all focused on the uh, committee uh, and really you know, staying in our lane and really focusing on what, what are we doing, which is you know, maximum employment for the entire economy and price stability. And we, and we recognize that we have the tools that we need to achieve those goals, but there are many other goals. And, and, and typically, those tools would be outside the domain of monetary policy. They would involve fiscal policy or or other policies, and we really want to focus on having the toolkit that we need for our objectives. Question right here. Recognizing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, all the media, uh, you guys take your knocks pretty well, and you, you really don't say much. What can we, as a community who have come here, we're out doing our jobs every day, what can we do for the Fed? Uh, you know, to, to talk about your mandates and what's really mm -hmm. going on and what do you really want to do for the community? What can we do for you? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate for me to weigh in. I mean, the reason we're doing this event so is so we can hear from you all and, and, uh, and uh, appreciate, you know, the offer of support, but we're just, we're just focusing on doing what we need to do and getting the best information we can to do it. So thank you very much.